Today I, I won't discuss that in detail, and, I, and you don't. Uh, I don't want you to, de to to read it in very much detail. You see, in this, uh, I have given uh, in the second couple. I've, I've tried to to co to a lot these activities to sociology, history, and philosophy of science. Um, all of them made a case, started with a case study, a specific historical episode in experiment, and I have listed those, uh, and I have listed the fields from which, which they come, and you see it's mainly 19th and 20th centuries, a little bit uh, 17th century, and often enough uh, these authors have drawn quite general results out of their case studies. <coughs> This is one, one uh, methodological remark here. It's interesting to see that this new uh, interest in experiments, this new experimentalism, was totally based on historical case studies. <clears throat> we could ask, why is that so? One answer is, uh, and I think this characterizes the, the, the general tendency quite clearly, all of them, I think one, one is, it's fair enough to say all of them didn't look at the, the outside of science or at, at the side of science that we can read from published papers, from, from uh, published uh, uh, texts in general, but all of them tried to look at the process of science in the laboratory, in the field, or even at the desk. Um, <coughs> So how, how do people reason from, how do, do they do experiment, and how do they reason from experiment? So there was a turn toward, or a movement, a tendency towards what I would call research practice, uh, by contrast to the presenting the ready-made research. One, uh, one could nicely put that in the, in the words of François Jacob, who uh, at, in, in his uh, famous book uh, on the mice, uh, he started with making the difference between night science and day science. And what we see here, all of them, all of this new experimentalism is based on looking what of the process of science or what François Jacob would call the night science. <laughs> What have we learned from all of this? <clears throat> um, I, I think what, what the new experimentalism has done is to open a wide scope of aspects we have to include when analyzing experiments. It, I, I give you just, just uh, keywords, just uh, catchwords. Making facts. How are experimental facts uh, consolidated uh, up to the point that they can be communicated. We have, there are very strong and fierce debates about that point. There have been sociologists, sociologists came in and uh, pointed very sharply this is always also a social process to agree upon an experimental finding. Uh, there were much debate, as you know, there was, uh, of course, you can pull, you can infer very different degrees of, uh, of generalization from here. They pointed to the complexity of experimental research in each particular case. You cannot understand it without having a full historical complexity. Uh, they made out the various, various a multitude of epistemic roles of experiment, not just testing or refining theories. There, were much, there was a strong focus on experiment and instrument, on experiment using materials. Of course, every experiment uses materials, and they do matter of the resources of experiments in terms of money, of space, uh, of uh, equipment, of invisible helpers. Uh, there is uh, ongoing research on many of these, on experiment and precision, what, uh, on the rhetoric of experiment, of experiment in public space, and so on. So what we have learned is that to analyze the history of experiment, we need, and, and to, to uh, invoke proper reflections on how experimental, si experimental approaches work, we have to include many more aspects and not just the focus on how to theorize from experiments. <laughs> Again, I think this is a, a, a very rich result. This, and actually, it's not a result at this point. It's an ongoing uh, uh, activity 
in many of these uh, um, questions or, or these topics you, we find ongoing publications and we are far from having uh, a closed picture that we could say okay now we understand fully uh, how experimental approaches work. <laughs> One thing, yeah, okay. I think this gives me the the occasion to to stop this or to the end with this more general part: uh, history of experiment and history of re reflections on experiment, and to go to to pick up one out of this list, one one specific aspect. One I have done contributed done with others some some work, and this is uh, again this. What are the third point that I called multitude of epistemic function of experiment? In the next two sections, I will pick out this topic and pick out one specific um, result we have seen in the last 15 years um, and show you how this works and again where where the challenges are and uh, the, the the hope for further research. So. This is called exploratory experimentation. <laughs> um, the the background is to to see how did how do scientists and how did scientists um, do experiment in a non-Duhamian, non-Popperian, non-standard view mode. How did they experiment in periods, in episodes where no theory was available, for example? <laughs> And this brought, brought uh, Ian Hacking in 1983 in his book uh, al already addressed some of these uh, or, or gave episodes, gave historical accounts uh, to say, okay, uh, we here we have example where obviously no theory was available. Nevertheless, people did experimental research with very good successes. Hacking did not do much, fo much, much, uh, did not go much further, and it took and again 10 to 15 years to spell out how such experimental procedures could really work. <coughs> um, it's a, 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 it was a quite a strange episode that in 1997 two papers appeared that both of them. Um, totally independently, one by Richard Burian, um, an uh, US American uh, historian, philosopher of biology, uh, another one by me, uh, both in American journals, uh, and both they used the term of exploratory experiment. <coughs> um, exp exploratory experimentation. Um, I'll give you, uh, and, and they actually they had a quite close fit to each other. Not exactly, but they had very different case studies, but very, some general lines came out to be surprisingly similar. The, uh, they described the procedure, the experimental procedure, as a systematic variation of experimental parameters, much as Mill has to, had described a uh, hundred years earlier. The goal in this, uh, in this um, variation procedure was of the scientists was exploring at new fields, grasping regular behaviors, formulating laws. The, and the, in, in Swingley, the, the results were exactly empirical regularity, sometimes called laws, or basic structure, basic structures and processes, identifying the basic structure and processes of a field. <laughs> the instruments used um, for that exploratory uh, uh, enterprise was usually broad instruments, both allowing broad variations and being sensitive for a broad range of different signals. When, did, when, do, those, when, do, the, when, when do those episodes of exploratory experimentation occur? Not surprisingly, exactly in situations in which no ready-made theory is available or in which such theory is, for, for example, being shaken or brought, uh, brought in, in, see in, in the necessity of revision by, for example, new insights from experimental or theoretical side. <laughs> this type of exploratory experimentation can be easily contrasted uh, to the rather standard view experimentation, which I, which I call often theory-driven experimentation which, uh, and in many uh, respects you see really sharp contrasts. It's uh, 
theory-driven experimentation. The procedure is optimizing an apparatus in respect to a, a given purpose. The goal is, of course, testing, refining, specifying a theory. The answer, and of course the, the result might be an answer, might or might not be the answer uh, for a theory. The instruments are specified, very specific and optimized instruments, not broad instruments, very sensitive for a specific type of signals and not for a broad type of signal. And of course, they, uh, when they occur always, and they occur often, when you have a specific theory, to, or well-formulated theory, to be specified or tested. This is a very general scheme that has been actually uh, refined and discussed since then. Two important points came up in the discussion and I just wanted to, to make them uh, exploratory experimenting. Experimenting is a systematic procedure, it's often a systematic procedure. It's not just random playing around with the apparatus. It has deliberate goals, it has deliberate um, uh, procedures. And of course, it is not driven by theory. The, uh, it's not a theory that gives it its, uh, its goals and its uh, uh, procedures. But nevertheless, it would be senseless to call it a theory-free experiment. There are much debates around that point. <clears throat> This is the abstract view I have given you. I, I will run through some examples just for illustrations. <clears throat> First, the one Dick Burian had presented in 1997. <clears throat> <In 97. clears throat> uh, Burian had analyzed uh, research, laboratory research of a group uh, in Belgium in the 1930s and 40s around Jean Prachet. Uh, in, the, in the end, the, this group did research on protein biosynthesis. So how are proteins produced in the living cell? <laughs> um, and he described the, the procedures he found in the laboratory books fit nicely to the description I gave now. <clears throat> and what I give here is uh, just one uh, very nice illustration of their result. I think their most striking results was giving a sort of map of cellular structures and cellular processes that contribute and that are essential for protein biosynthesis. Um, I won't discuss it in detail, but uh, the, the major point is they, they found out and they, uh, they mapped out a first basic structure that would later serve as, of course, on, uh, as a base for all future research. <clears throat> Some of these things have changed up to this day, some, but the basic structure is still kept. <clears throat> this was the result of a long and intense period of exploratory experimentation. My second example, totally different, totally different realm, totally different time, uh, goes on, on André Marie Ampère. Um, in his reaction, in his very feverish reaction to the news of the discovery of electromagnetic or the electromagnetic effect in 1820. That would be a long story to be told. I won't do. Uh, the ampere I present here is an ampere who is completely more or less unknown, or who had been unknown up to these researches, because he himself didn't write about, didn't write much about those uh, activities in his very first weeks. Um, after this new effect was announced. Ampere was completely um, uh, sucked in, he was completely feverish, he spent lots of time and lots of money to, to do research uh, in, and some authors have it rightly described as a feverish research, research, he worked day and night, he presented to every week to the academy and in his first phase he, did a, he followed quite a different style than what is known of Ampere. He started with an apparatus uh, on the left side, I, he has called an aiguille astatique, an aesthetic needle, uh, positioned in a certain way to, um, to um, block the effect of terrestrial magnetism, so, as, so to, to be able to study the interaction between the galvanic current 
and the, and, and the magnetic needle without the influence of terrestrial magnetism. <laughs> What did he do? Again, I have listed up a little bit. Uh, he, he did a procedure of systematic variation. He varied the materials of the wire and the needle. He, he varied the strength and the polarity of the battery. The positions between wire and needle, that was the most important point because he quickly realized there was the challenge <coughs> and many other things. The, his aim in the procedure was exactly identify experimental factors that are indispensable, that are modifying or that just don't affect the, 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 the result. <coughs> he, was, he aimed at forma, for formulating laws or general facts, as we shall see in a moment, and to reduce, and this is his word, to reduce all other phenomena to those general facts. <coughs> To make a long story short, he succeeded. <coughs> you see here, this is his formulation uh, that he uh, gave as a result of these uh, uh, feverish weeks of research. You, you might read it quicker than me. Uh, you see, and, and I will just summarize um, what he, it's all about interaction of a, of a wire and, uh, and a needle com uh, in, in this aesthetic uh, arrangement. <coughs> and he says, well, the one result is of course, they always go into a right angle. The needle posits itself into a right angle. But then the challenge, and, and this is his second sentence then, is to determine there are two, right, two, two possibilities of right angle, this and this one. Um, and which is the one, uh, to, how can we determine more closely? And this he, he ended up, and this was a long procedure uh, with this new concept, to, he settled, he said, um, the North Pole would set itself on the left side, on that which that we call galvanic current, and the South Pole on the right side. The interesting thing is, what does he mean? He, of course, uh, he, he invented these concepts of left side and right side. Uh, the, 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 no, nothing was uh, like, no, nothing like that before. Um, and he, he, illustrated, uh, he didn't illustrate it. This is a later illustration that you see here. He gave a long passage immediately after this one, uh, explaining what he meant uh, and uh, we have a later illustration you see here uh, with a swimmer, and this is exactly what he, the, 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 the pictorial languages he invokes, is giving a picture of a man, uh, who, the current running through him. He is looking towards the, the wire, and then his right and left hand give the right and left directions he defines like this. So the, the interesting thing I want to point out here, Ampere was able to formulate a law for this electromagnetic interaction, but only by introducing, by framing a completely new concept. It didn't work with the concepts he had available. <laughs> and this is a, a, a thing we see often in exploratory experimentation. Not necessarily, but often. This holds for my second case too. My second case is uh, the similar, um, again, similar time, similar um, uh, subject field, electromagnetism, but a year later Michael Faraday, at then point a completely unknown um, um, laboratory assistant in London, started doing uh, this electromagnetic effect, starting revising everything he found, including Ampere, and he took up questions Ampere had left. Ampere had left this type of research very quickly when he realized he could find a way to mathematize, which was very different from here and uh, from what I have shown you. And uh, then he left his exploratory work completely, just he left it undone and he knew it was unfinished, it wasn't ready. Um, Faraday took up uh, the thing and uh, tried to uh, investigate again the positions, uh, the, the electromagnetic interaction between wire and needle, and even in asymmetric positions, in asymmetric constellations, the, uh, a point Ampere hadn't done, he had envisaged but not contacted. Um, I could tell, uh, again, a long story, uh, again, variation procedure, again, a variation of parameters, mainly positions here. Uh, Faraday ended up with a, with a claim 
that experiment that these positions could be best or these constellations could be best grasped in a general law by the in, by, by thinking of circular motions you see here a, a, an excerpt from his diary and in the end after a day's work uh, and this was not just this day's work he ended up with the idea of circular movements between magnets and magnetic poles and wires and actually this uh, then he, he he started out to to realize these motions he was um, successful and invented the first circular the first apparatus for circular motion electric circular motion <coughs> this invention was one thing the what he came up with was the the result that circular motion of magnetic pole and wire is a simple case or an elementary case sometimes he says to which all other electric motions could be reduced and again this is his word as uh, réduire uh, Ampère had, had uh, claimed, oh, I forgot to mention that, Ampère had claimed that uh, to this, to the fait général, uh, I quoted you, and uh, comp comp combined with another fait général, a deuxième fait général, all other electromagnetic motions could be reduced to those two. And similar claim we find in Faraday, but again, uh, very different, So, uh, but the, the general structure is the same. Identify a general fact, and or a simple case and reduce all others to, to, to them. <clears throat> Faraday wrote, uh, was in correspondence with Ampere and wrote in a letter to him a very, I think, a, a very nice um, characterization of his work. He said, I feel my way by placing facts closely together. Keep that in mind, I will come back to that. <clears throat> um, but I hurry to my next example, this uh, again a French example from uh, electricity um, 100 years earlier, 80 years earlier, Charles Dufay uh, experimenting on electricity and so Charles Dufay uh, in the Botanic Garden in Paris, um, he did lots of work on electricity and one of them was to investigate the quite um, weird effects of electric attraction. This was a traditional effect, uh, effect and the traditional mode of operation of electricity, but also people had described electric repulsion. And Dufay was determined to find a law of electric repulsion uh, or electric attraction and repulsion. Again, long procedure, again with the very same specificities that we had before, uh, varying uh, um, parameters one by one, etc. And of course, uh, as we know, he came up with, an, with the law. And the characteristic thing, in order to formulate that law, that's the law we know all, he had to revise and to, to uh, um, sh shuffle around the very fundamental uh, concept of electricity. Electricity up to that point